Okay, Bob, we've already heard that you've got a little bit of familiarity with the Baltimore Orioles. What, why don't you tell us kind of about the franchise itself, the owner, how it's evolved over the last few years? Well, you know, when I covered the Orioles, the Hofberger family and Frank Cashin was a general manager in the 70s, and it was a family owned, like many ball clubs back in there. And uh, it was, uh, you know, the Orioles, there were, seasons, there were some seasons when they weren't that good. And the fans wouldn't come out to the old stadium, Memorial Stadium. I mean, the, the Oriole fans are pretty smart people, and uh, they, they will support you, but you better have a pretty good ball club. And I think Peter Angelos and John Angelos, the owners right now, are finding that out in the last couple of years. There's been some vacant seats at Camden Yards, and you can only, you'll, you can only have a, a kind of a honeymoon with a new ballpark for so many years. And I think they rode that honeymoon in the beginning of the 1990s, and they had a couple good ball clubs. They got to the playoffs. But the last, oh, seven, eight years, it's just been pathetic. And the Oriole fans are finally saying, you know, enough's enough. Put a good, could have put a good uh, uh, product on the field, and uh, we'll come out again. But uh, they're not going to just go ahead and just support a team that's going to be 20 games under 500 every year. So for a community like Sarasota, for purposes of spring training, how would you compare the Orioles with the Red Sox? <laughs> Well, <laughs> just look at the standings the last few years. Uh, the marquee players really aren't there with the Orioles, like you have you know, the Red Sox, that star attraction. Uh, I still think Andy McPhail, who's come on to become the president and general manager of the club, will eventually turn that club around to at least a 500 ball club. But you've got to remember, you're in the same division with the Yankees, the uh, Blue Jays, the Red Sox, the Rays. and now the Rays. All yeah. of a sudden, you know, the Rays were your fifth place team in that division, and now everybody's looking, well, the Rays are number one. So uh, the Orioles are going to sit at 500 or, or 10, 15 games below for a little bit until some of their younger players come up through the farm system and develop. And maybe then one out of every five years you'll have a shot to make a run at a playoff spot or a wild card spot. A couple of the carrots that the Orioles are dangling for the Sarasota taxpayers, voters, mm -hmm. commissioners are, uh, first of all, let's start with the first one, that they have their sports network up there and they're going to they're gonna give a plug to Sarasota you know. and advertise Sarasota on their sports network. What do you think about the value of that? Not too good if you look at the numbers. I think they were ranked, with, when I saw Sports Business Journal recently, they were ranked 28th on the, uh, on the list, right near the bottom. I think Kansas City and Pittsburgh were below it. So uh, the dollar value is not going to be there. <clears throat> and I think what the, the commissioners here need to do is look at the, uh, the stats that come out of how many people have gone to Fort Lauderdale out of Baltimore in the Mid-Atlantic area in recent years and just see if there's an upswing there because those are the same people that are going to be coming over to Sarasota. So I don't think the TV deal is that, that big of a plum when you look at it from, from a realistic number standpoint. Another thing that they've, they've, pr they've sort of put forth is that they can get legendary Hall of Famer Cal Ripken Jr., probably the most famous living Oriole, and they can get him to come in here and and start a youth camp and work with our youngsters here. Uh, what do you know about Cal and his program? Well, I, I've known Cal since he was 16 years old. I actually went out and covered him when he was at Aberdeen High School. He was quite a pitcher in those days, and I followed his career. And just a great gentleman. He really is what you see uh, on the field is what you get off the field. Just a, a great father, a good, um, a good legend of the baseball game. I mean, if, you, if you're a father and you want your son to look up to somebody, that's the guy. Uh, I did talk to John Maroon recently, and John Maroon used to be the Orioles PR director. He runs a lot of the Ripken baseball facility, and I talked to John. He was flying out to Denver the other day, and I said, John, is it a sweetheart deal that Ripken, if, if, if the Orioles come here, then you get Ripken, but if the Orioles don't come here, it, would Ripken you know, possibly come to Sarasota with his academy? And he said, Bob, it's not, they're not linked together. If Sarasota made a good offer to Cal and his academy to set their facilities up here, it wouldn't necessarily have to be tied into the Orioles coming here. So I would hope that the commissioners, when they're negotiating prices with the Orioles, keep that in mind. Because I think Ripken baseball is a fine opportunity for uh, fathers and mothers to get their kids involved in baseball. It's a very wholesome, very family-oriented. It'd be a great plum to have that here in, uh, in Sarasota. So you think we could get the, the Ripken deal, and I've been to the Ripken facility mm -hmm. in Myrtle Beach, it's great. Oh, yeah. You think we could get that here even without the Orioles? I do, again, if, if the deal was right. I don't think it's linked necessarily if the Orioles come here, or if they don't come here, you're not going to get Ripken. I don't, think that's, I don't think that's the case. You've heard, you've heard the numbers that have been thrown around. What's your kind of overall verdict on, on the Orioles deal that's on the table right now? Well, I want to keep 
Major League Baseball and spring training in Sarasota. I live here. I love baseball. It's been part of my life, and I want to see it here. I know what it, I know what it does to the community. I know what it can, the value it brings. And once you lose it, you're not going to get it back. But you have to get it back at the right price, not at Red Sox prices. If those numbers that I read, 65 to 70 million, were true, I think the Orioles are more like the Reds, probably in that 35 to 42 million range. And if you could get the Ripken Academy brought in with that. I'd do it in a minute. I think you could develop this and maybe even have like a convention each year before spring training starts and bring some of those old-time Orioles back that people 40 and older would remember. Bring in Brooks Robinson and Boog Powell and Jim Palmer down here. Have them do a meet and greet with the fans on a weekend and also get some of the younger Oriole players involved in that so that the young kids today can look up to these guys as their heroes and really cultivate a really great opportunity which Sarasota could be very proud of and build on that uh, platform. Bob, thanks very much for coming on the show. You've brought to the table a perspective that we really haven't heard or seen reported in the papers around here, so I really appreciate it. My Thank pleasure, you. Ron. Thanks so much. All right. Now it's time for everybody's favorite segment, our Weasel of the Week. Northport, as some of the viewers of past episodes may know, is a place that fascinates me greatly. Uh, Northport is an area where you have a few uh, people that live in very upscale, gated communities and uh, that generally run the city and then you have you have everybody else and uh, the people who live in a lot of these gated communities basically want to the other people who don't to at least act like they do and Northport has had tough code enforcement there's a great story uh, last week's paper written by a reporter named John Davis who did a great job on the city of Northport and their draconian almost Nazi-like code enforcement tactics. They did a story on a, on a guy named Dick Shade, who's a retired gentleman who, um, who had, in his, uh, had, a, had a plastic pool in his backyard for his grandson. Anyway, his fines ended up totaling about $12,000 before he removed the pool. And he tried to negotiate and offer him you know, $2,000 to settle the case. And our Weasel of the Week is uh, Assistant City Manager Danny Schult, who uh, who basically gave a let him eat cake quote and said absolutely not two thousand is chicken feed it's not enough for us well two thousand is a pretty hefty fine to pay for putting up a plastic pool in your backyard for his grandson the new northport city commissioners are going to get these people under control and that's a good thing danny schult you need to kind of wise up a little bit get with the program you've worked for the government too long and you need to get your wits about you or else these new city commissioners will go find somebody else to do your job. That's Cloud 941. We'll see you next week.